Welcome to another episode of Agent Provocateur. I'm Alan Walsh with Adam Wild. Our guest this week hails from New Canaan, Connecticut. He's a product of Taft Prep School, Sioux City of the United States Hockey League, the University of Michigan. He's a former first round pick, 22nd overall of the Montreal Canadiens, a U.S. Olympian in 2015, voted by his teammates in Montreal as the 29th captain in franchise history, a Bill Masterton award winner, a six-time 30-goal scorer in 800-plus NHL games, more than 300 goals, more than 300 assists, 610 career points, and a client of mine since 2018. I'm honored to introduce and welcome to the show, Max Pacioretty. Yay. <laughs> you make me feel old with that intro. <laughs> That's quite the resume, Max. Yeah. <laughs> we're going yeah, to yeah. need some intro music next time. Yeah. I mean, I thought, are we, are we done here? That was long enough for an episode right there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you next week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Max, uh, when, you're, when your agent uh, calls you or texts you and says, hey, I'm doing a podcast, does that make you nervous a little bit? Not when it's Alan. If maybe it was someone else. I know that uh, uh, Alan's probably the most calculated person I've I've ever met in my life. So I know if he's doing something, that I have nothing to worry about. And uh, I've heard, you know, it's taken off as uh, as expected. So excited for you guys. Great job. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. I wanted to start off by asking you about, you know, coming from Connecticut, hailing from Connecticut, and uh, what it was like playing youth hockey there. Uh, there's not a ton of NHL players coming from, uh, that region, although there's a few, uh, you're probably the uh, highest profile one to ever come out of Connecticut. Why don't uh, you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Growing up in Connecticut, you know, when it, I didn't know at the time, but looking back on it, the Rangers won the cup in 94, I was turning six years old. Um, that's when I just went to the rink, went to open skate, uh, eventually, Kept going back with my parents and uh, there was a sign-up sheet on the wall for hockey. I think there's a number two pencil right next to it. I just put my name on it and the rest was history. And, and as you mentioned, no one had ever made the NHL from Connecticut. Um, the, the one guy was uh, Ryan Chan and he made it, he made it first. He played uh, in Darien, Connecticut. Uh, that's, you know, the rink that I grew up at because we didn't have an indoor rink in my hometown. Um, however, on our team alone, I think five kids ended up making the NHL. Um, um, from our, and we, we won the national championship, Kevin Shattenkirk, Cam Atkinson, Mark Arcabello, myself, uh, there are a couple others that, that I'm forgetting, but it, it, I think it all started with, um, a coach we had by the name of Mike Backman. He, uh, his son, Sean Backman, uh, played plays still, I think, whether it's in Europe or the AHL, he's actually the father in law of Jonathan quick and oh. Matt Molson. Uh, he was my coach growing up. He was Quickie's coach growing up. Uh, I think he's the one who started uh, the whole trend of hockey in Connecticut. And I've heard now that going back, my old team at Fairfield, someone told me just recently that they're number one in the country for every age group. Um, mm -hmm. Trevor Zegris uh, played there, uh, Spencer Knight. And, and I've heard that there's a lot of uh, kids coming up that have been getting drafted from there. So I don't know. Uh, we definitely helped start that wave, but I can't take all the credit because just like everything else, I think the coaching, especially from that coach that I mentioned, Mike Backman, I think that kind of started the wave for Connecticut hockey. And it's exciting because, uh, you know, I take a lot of pride in that. And, and it's hopefully something we can do here in Vegas uh, as the years go on as well. Right. Well, you, you've got four uh, boys playing hockey right now uh in vegas so i have a feeling uh vegas minor hockey youth hockey is gonna see a significant increase down the road here in attention because uh, uh from the clips i've seen of your kids already and uh playing some uh, hockey uh, stick hockey on my knees in the back of your house uh, you got a couple of uh great players coming down the line yeah, it's, you know what? I love it. I love the youth hockey. I learned from it. I really want to get involved in it. Marty St. Louis has uh, taken over really the hockey uh, uh, situation in Connecticut. He lives down there now. He's coaching, you know, kids up and 
a lot of kids have whether played pro or D one. That's something I want to do. I, I really have a lot of passion in it, not just because my kids are doing it, but it's uh, it's really a lot of fun. As you know, most hockey parents have been down that road, and uh, you know I'm really looking forward to it. Now I want to bring you to uh, the evening of March eight, two thousand eleven. Uh, you had uh, established yourself as a really good young player in the NHL. You're playing against the Boston Bruins and uh, really very early in your career, NHL career, suffered a fairly devastating injury, being uh, uh, checked into the stanchion at the end of the bench and uh, going down on the ice. uh, It was a scary sight. I remember it well. I remember you being stretchered off the ice. Can you describe what goes through a player's mind? Uh, what went through your mind at that time? What kind of injuries did you suffer from uh, that event? And what was it like rehabbing and getting back to playing again in the NHL? Yeah, the the, the first, uh, I guess, memory I have from it was waking up in um, the ambulance, um, not ex- entirely sure who was with me, but my wife wasn't there. Who was my girlfriend at the time? Wasn't there at the game. Um, uh, but for some reason I, it took me a little while. It took me like five minutes and I, and I remembered her phone number. And the first thing I did was call her and my parents were at the game actually. So I, I had forgotten that a little bit, but, uh, I woke up in the ambulance freaking out a bit, uh, got to the hospital, took the all the scans, uh, had a fractured neck C4, um, obviously had a pretty severe concussion. I was out for a significant amount of time, um, uh, unconscious. And, uh, however that, that didn't play too much of a role in my rehab because I recovered from that pretty quickly. But, um, you know, the, the good news is nobody babied me. And, and I don't mean that in like, a um, you know, a negative way. It, it was, it was just kind of, you know, let's carry on and and let's look past this and let's uh, try and get better from it. Like every other, you know, piece of adversity I've had to deal with in my life. And um, whether it be my family, my wife, my parents, uh, my trainer, everybody kind of had the same approach. Let's get better from this. Um, And I did. I I didn't want to let that define me. Didn't want to go down as the player who, you know, uh, broke his neck on the stanchion and they eventually changed it to a curved glass. No, I want to, I want to put all that in my past. And I think uh, that's what I'm most proud about, especially my time in Montreal, that that seems to have been forgotten. You know, young guys now come in the league and, you know, a guy gets injured. Patrick, have you ever gotten a concussion? And, (laughs) you know, (laughs) yeah, I got a pretty bad one. And uh, But it it seems like people have forgotten about that. And that's the way I like it. Uh, You know, I hope that I've accomplished so much more in my career that that doesn't define me. Um, as much as I want to sit here and say, you know, the rehab was so hard and this and that, I had a long time to recover team lost out in the playoffs. Coincidentally to Boston. Um, I had the whole summer to train with, uh, uh, Ben Prentice, best trainer in the world. We turned my body into, I mean, I'll show you the before and after pictures. It was insane. And and he still uses that as a, uh, talking point in all of his seminars. Now he said, you know, uh, this is what you can do if, if you have, you know, the right amount of time, and the, I guess the right mindset to really, uh, you know, come out of a bad situation and and make it a good one. And, and since that point on, I never looked back, my career took off from there. And I really think that it was handling that adversity the right way that helped me get to where I'm at right now. Matt, Max, I got to ask you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alan. Go ahead, Adam. Well, I just want to ask, you know, Alan, you know, Matt, when you're, when you're going through something like that, do you, um, do you, does it start to put in this to into stark contrast, I guess, how uh, precious it is to play in the NHL? Like, do you, do you find a newfound um, appreciation for the fact that you're there? I do now, but I won't lie. I didn't at the time I was too young and naive to think that um, that could all get taken away from me. I think there was one time in the hospital, right when it happened, I remember, I think I told my dad, I was like, you know, oh, this could be the end of it for me. And you know, like I said, he didn't baby me. He said, no, you're gonna be fine. This is nothing. This is just a bump in the road. And I, I honestly, I didn't have one negative thought after that moment. And that's what, uh, really, you know, makes it, uh, so valuable to have the right people in your corner, friends and family, as I mentioned, my trainer as well. Now looking back on it, I mean, 
everything could have gone south from there easily. I could have, you know, you have a bad couple of months, especially in Montreal, you feel bad. You, you know, feel sorry for yourself. You end up in the minors. <laughs> I could, it could have, it could have gone the wrong way easily looking back on it in hindsight. But, um, I think the supporting cast that I had in the moment really helped me avoid that situation. Now, Max, I know you to be one of the most knowledgeable, informed, and and just really obsessed with the new age training methods that are out there right now versus the old school way that uh, things were probably when you came into the league and in some corners of the league might still be like that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I live and breathe uh, training, nutrition any little, you know, advantage I can get through, you know, doing, making the right decisions. It's an entirely different league than it was once before. I think when I first came in, it was, you know, the old, put your bag in the hotel, go have a few beers, go out for dinner. And then, uh, you know, wake up the next morning, sweat it out and morning skate. And, and that's the way the league was. I mean, how are you supposed to, how are you supposed to catch up with a Connor McDavid? If that's your routine, <laughs> you got to think that's someone's always trying to have a, some sort of an event, some sort of an advantage. And, and that's something that, you know, as I get older in my career, this is, you know, areas that I have to explore to try and always last as long as I can, keep my speed as best as I can. I've had my fair share of injuries, so there's always ways to recover better from them. And, uh, you know, just today out on the ice, we, the team got a new machine called the 10, 1080 Sprint. We were out there. Uh, I brought it out there. And then, uh, you know, a couple of uh, the other guys came over, some of the young guys. We started doing some uh, reps together, and it's just, it's something I'm addicted to. I, I love that kind of grind and, and I love the process even more so than the result. And I think that's what's going to keep me going for a long time. Hey, Max, can you run us through, um, and this is going to sound silly, but can you run us through like a day on game day for you? What do you eat? <laughs> when do you get up? Like, how does that all work? Because I think the average person probably has no idea and, yeah. you know, probably assumes, oh yeah, these guys probably go out on the road all the time. Not for you. <laughs> oh no, it is. I mean, the preparation that goes here, I'll, I'll put you through, I guess, a home game. I wake up, go to the rink, eat breakfast, get treatment, uh, stretch, roll out a little bit, uh, skate, uh, pregame skate, and then normally do a little bit of a lift, um, cold tub, eat lunch. I've heard, I've heard the cold tub's a lot of fun, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, I do about four or five of them on a game day. So, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So then I, I eat, come home, nap. I do my Normatec, uh, some breathing stuff. Sometimes what's the Normatec for anybody? Uh, Normatec know. is a recovery boot. It kind of uh, flushes your legs, squeezes them with air, and uh, I don't know, just <laughs> another another recovery tool. So, wake up from the nap, have a snack, go to the rink, another cold tub, uh, meetings, uh, warm up, another cold tub, uh, go out on the ice play the first period another cold tub and then uh yeah the rest is uh and then after the game probably another one as well <laughs> so in between the first and second period you take all of your equipment off get into a cold tub and then put it all on again uh before the start of the second yes mo most of the time if, if it's a away rink with not a great setup i probably won't uh oftentimes though like in the playoffs i, I do it almost after every single period um, just, uh, something to shock the body and, and, uh, makes you feel a little bit more fresh. Yeah. So Gary Smith, when he played goal, uh, in the NHL, in the 1970s was famous with his teammates for taking all of his goaltending equipment off at the end of the first period, jumping in the shower, taking a shower, putting everything back on again, and then doing that again after the second period. So <laughs> he'd be taking a shower after, uh, every period that he played. Yeah. It's like you get in these routines and it's not even superstitious. I just feel better while doing it. And, and mine's not even too crazy. A couple other guys have weirder things, but it, it, it does help me. I think when you're on the road and you're not able to do it the same way, do you feel it when you go back out there in the second period? Is it kind of like, ah, you know, I don't feel as fresh or how does that kind of work for you? Yeah. So, you know, some rinks have really bad setups in the away room for that. Um, I, I mean, if I, if I, tell myself, ah, maybe I should do it. And then I go out and have a bad second period. I'm, I just, it's hard for me to live with myself knowing that I didn't, you know, go back to that process that I talked about that I'm, you know, I'm addicted to, uh, uh for the most part I do it. And, and if I, if I had a good period and my legs aren't feeling it, maybe say, 
you know, tonight's not the night I had a good first period and, and I could just roll with this, but for the most part I do it. And, and it's not fun. It's, I mean, getting in that ice bath is never fun, but you feel like if you can go through that, you can go through anything. Hmm. Now in 2015, uh, you were voted by your teammates, captain of the Montreal Canadiens. You're the 29th captain in franchise history. What did that moment mean to you at the time? It's my proudest hockey uh, moment in my career. Uh, I like the way you worded it because that makes it so much better being voted by your teammates than, you know, being handed something. Um, I felt that I feel and will always feel that I deserved it. Um, you know, uh, Montreal is not an easy place to play, especially when you're an American captain, but I'm so proud of, uh, everything I accomplished there. Um, uh, I have no regrets for my time in Montreal, but, but my biggest, uh, achievement in my life and probably the most emotional, uh, moment of my life was being named captain by my teammates. How did you find out? Yeah. Uh, we voted, it was kind of, um, it came out of the blue. We were just in our, in our, in our, uh, meeting pre-camp and they said, all right, all the returning players that were here last year stick around. And so we're going to have a vote. Um, and, uh, we voted and, and where we were doing that wasn't too far away from my house. So I think when they counted the votes, they came to my house, Michelle Terry and Mark Bergeron and, uh, uh, big Mike, he just, he opened the door and just gave me a big hug. It was like, uh, it was like a proud, I felt like, you know, it was like a proud father son moment right there. And, and I had that with my dad after, but he was a, a coach that really meant a lot to me. He still does learned so much from him. And, uh, that moment was pretty special between, uh, a coach and his captain. Uh, how, who is the first person you call when, when you are the, the, the new captain of an original six franchise and the most storied franchise in hockey? Well, my dad and, and, you know, it was special for us because my grandma, not many people know, but my grandmother was from Montreal. She was, a. Uh, she was an anesthesiologist at the Montreal general hospital. I used to go up there and see, um, a lot of her relatives when I was younger, went to a game actually at the forum when I was a kid. So, you know, even though I was a kid from uh, Connecticut with no prior hockey history, I still had some ties to Montreal. And I think that made it even more special for, for myself and for my dad as well. What I can tell you is that uh, uh, when you and I started working together, uh, I had the chance to speak with people like Sir Savard, uh, former captain of the Canadians Hall of Famer, uh, former uh, general manager of the Canadians, and the amount of respect that he has for you and, and had for you back in Montreal when you wore the C was just unbelievable. And talking to Guy Lafleur back then, um, to hear from the legends how they felt that you truly carried the torch uh, high uh, in the um, in, in the way that they would be proud and they were proud, uh, spoke a lot of the commitment that you made to the city and the commitment you made to the team and, and the way you played on the ice. That was an area I took the most pride in. Um, I would stick around in the summers. You mentioned the alumni, not just any alumni. These were, you know, hall of fame alumni, uh, with their numbers and their rafters at the bell center. I took, that's what I think I took the most pride in. And those were the people that I, you know, tried to reach out to the most, uh, um, you know, I valued everyone's opinion, obviously some more than others, uh, when it comes to media and fans and, and, uh, alumni and, and especially, you know, uh, hall of famers, but, but I really made an effort, I think, to, uh, uh, reach out to them, lean on them for advice, um, played golf with a lot of them, Carbo, seeing them at, uh, golf tournaments, um, uh, charity functions, uh, they just had so much insight. And I felt when I was there that we weren't utilizing that as an organization as much as we should have. They felt it. I felt it. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the opinions, um, from them mattered the most to me because they have been there. They've all won cups. They've all won, uh, multiple cups in fact. And so they knew how to win and they knew what it take. They knew what it took to be not only a captain, but, uh, uh, to be, uh, a, you know, a player that reached the ultimate goal. And, and, uh, I look at the, 
the trophy in the background of Alan's screen there in the picture. <laughs> and that's the ultimate goal. And, th- and those guys knew how to achieve it. So I leaned on them as much as I could. And I know we came up short, never accomplished my goal in Montreal, but I'll forever, you know, remember, you know, my moments and, and the conversations that I've had with them. Max, what do you, what would you say? Cause you've been, you're a leader in Vegas now as well. What would you say is different about being a leader in Montreal versus any other NHL city? That's a tough one. Montreal is an amazing place and I'm so proud of what I accomplished there. I just feel like everyone has a shelf life there. Um, Everyone told me it, ex-players, current players, um, fans, everyone, everyone said, you know, everyone has a shelf life here. Enjoy it while you're here, but make sure that uh, you don't let it affect you too much because everyone seems to go out in a not so positive way. And I was stubborn. I was hard headed. No, that won't happen to me. I'm going to be here for the rest of my career. I love it here. I live in Westmount. I'm down in the city with the fans going out to dinner every night. Um, and, and even when I did get traded, I still thought, you know, I could be here forever and and not have it affect me. But then when I saw the difference, uh, in Vegas, I kind of understood what everyone was talking about. I, there just seems to be so much less pressure and whether you admit it or not, you just go about your everyday life in such an easier manner that it, it really plays so much less of a toll on you, whether you're a leader, whether you're a young guy. There's, there's no media here. And, and even if you don't read the media in Montreal, you know, what's being said and, and, uh, in both languages too. And yeah. And Brian Burke's line was, uh, playing in Montreal is, is, uh, a lot harder than, than anywhere else. Cause you suck in two languages. So you're <laughs> 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 saying that's an example of one of the guys. So, um, the Vegas organization just does such a great job of, when you come to the rink, you just feel like, uh, whether you had the worst game of your life, you know, the first couple of days I had a, you know, you have a bad game and you come in the next morning and this, are people going to say hi to me and Hey patch, how you doing? You know, <laughs> sun's out today. It's just another day. Hockey goes, their life goes on and hockey's not the only thing in Vegas right now. And, and, and that support is kind of what I needed. And it took me a little bit of time. I've spoken to Alan about it to, to get used to that because I was so used to, you know, come to the rink after a loss, two or three losses. And, you know, it's the end of the world and, you know, no one's talking to each other and it's just heavy. And, uh, you know, you go out to dinner and everyone's complaining about the team and the traffic and the weather and, and Vegas, you can lose three in a row. And, and, uh, you know, everyone's still positive, you know, you're here for a reason and we believe in you and don't worry. I know you'll, you'll find your game and, and it really is a big difference. And, and I'm thankful that I'm here and I'm thankful that, uh, uh, when I came here, because just like anything else, things could have shifted uh, pretty negative for me, for me, if staying in Montreal there for a couple more years. But um, yeah, I know things happen for a reason. I do want to step in for a second question here, because it seems apropos to ask at this point how you guys even met up, because I know and I remember the story in 2018, Max, you were coming down to the end of the contract in Montreal and you switched agents. And I'm wondering, frankly, how much you guys can talk about how you first met, how you started working together. Uh, how did this relationship begin? Cause it's weird mid mid career for an agent to, or for a player to switch agents. Yeah. And, and you know what, you knowing that is another example of why it might be so difficult to play in Montreal because nobody would know in Vegas if I were to switch <laughs> agents. <laughs> uh, but I, I had known Alan for a couple of years before, like I said, I stayed in Montreal in the summer. Alan, would bring in all of his clients in the summer and we would train uh, with Paul Gagne down there at um, the gym. And then we'd have skates at LLC or LCC. Um, so I, I had known Alan for a while and obviously everybody knows Alan's reputation. He's going to, he's going to take a bullet for his clients no matter what. And I was just put in a situation where I just felt like I needed, you know, I don't want to say someone like Alan because Alan might be the, the only one to really do this and, and really, you know, take things, um, take control of the situation and make sure that no matter what um, my agent had my best interests. And we all know how that played out. Uh, There was a couple of things that happened uh, between the end of the year and me ultimately getting traded. And uh, you know, there were ups and downs of the roller coaster. I think the best line Alan ever said to me, and we haven't spoken about it since, but sometimes the best deals are the ones you turn down. 
And uh, everyone kind of knows about a situation that happened uh, before I got traded to Vegas. And I just couldn't be happier with the things, with how things turned out. And uh, really, at the end of the day, uh, agent fees don't uh, do enough justice for how much Alan has helped myself and my family. He's a, he's a part of my family now. And that situation kind of started it all. Alan, what's your perspective on that, that first meeting? Well, I, I, I remember getting a phone call from Max. Uh, it must have been around, I don't know, 530, 6 o'clock in the morning in Dallas uh, before the second day of the NHL draft, rounds two to seven. And I remember I got a, a phone call from a Montreal number and I answered it. And the first thing Max said was, I knew you were going to answer the phone. <laughs> I knew you would answer the phone. Uh, and, and we had a, a, a long talk at that time, probably 45 minutes, um, maybe even an hour. And at the end of the conversation, uh, Max asked me to, to work with him, to work for him. And uh, I went to the arena to, for the start of the, the draft, the second day of the draft. And uh, I text Mark Bergevin to please come up to the stands and, and meet with me. And, uh, and he, had, he said, is it important? We're going to start soon. And I said, yeah, it's important. I, w- I remember I was standing in section 119 and I stood up and he, he looked at me and I kind of waved and we made eye contact and he came up the stairs and uh, he goes, yeah, 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 what's up? What's up? I got to go. I got to go. And I said, uh, I just want to let you know that uh, I am now uh, working for Max Pacioretty. And he kind of looked at me and for about five seconds, he just looked at me with a blank stare. And then he said, uh, 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 okay, okay. Do you, do, do you know what's going on? And I said, uh, I, I know enough. And he said, oh, 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 okay, we'll talk later. And he went back down the stairs and, and that's when Max and I started working together. So what? <laughs> I, that's great. So so Alan, let me ask you, and Max and Alan, you know, for for context for people that maybe don't remember, what was going on? Well, um, at at that time, uh, and, and correct me if I get any of the details wrong, Max. There was a a trade in the works the day before, uh, sending uh, Max uh, to the LA Kings. It's well documented. It's public information. It's been discussed before. Um, and uh, a condition of that trade going through because um, LA was including in that deal their first round pick from the 2018 uh, draft was uh, Max agreeing to an extension uh, with the LA Kings as part of the trade. And, uh, and things kind of fell apart. Uh, I think most of all, uh, more than anything, Max didn't want to leave Montreal and was focused on staying in Montreal, not being traded. And I think that was probably the biggest thing right, right there more than anything else. Um, uh, but it was kind of sprung on you at the, at the 11th hour. And, uh, and there wasn't a lot of time to consider the ramifications of what was going on. And, uh, and, and the result of that was the next day, Max reached out. Max, what can you walk us through? And I'm not going to ask specifically about those situations and, and some of those conversations, because some of that stuff's private. But what kinds of emotions does a player go through? Do you did you go through? when you're looking at changing cities and sometimes that's out of your control completely. It was really an emotional time for myself. It was, uh, in fact, it was the day of my sister's wedding. Uh, oh, so I was on my phone great. the entire time, uh, calling Alan and, and trying to figure it out, wondering where I'm going, if I'm going somewhere, if are we having a contract tied to it? I, we always figure that there would probably have to be a contract tied to it so that, Montreal would have to get the most in return um, for the deal. Um, and, th- and then at the same time, you're feeling the emotions of, okay, well, I'm, am I going to go back and, you know, look at all these people who tried to trade me and, and say, how am I going to, you know, compete for, th- for them when I know that they were trying to get rid of me, you know, the whole time. So 
for me, I take a lot of pride in what I do. I, uh, I mean, people can read me like a book. I can't hide my emotions. Uh, it might be my biggest strength and also my biggest weakness. And that's why when I was dealing so with so much, whether it be in my final year uh, in Montreal or that summer, it was just so obvious with what I was dealing with. I, I would try and hide it as much as I can. There's only so, there's only so much you can tell the media, even your teammates, uh, the fans, you really can't tell them anything. So, um, I, I was hiding a lot and I was, it was starting to overwhelm me and, and it, it definitely got the better of me a couple of times in the summer. I think Alan still has a picture of a broken phone, maybe somewhere in his uh, photo gallery. But, uh, <laughs> but we got through it. Hey, like my injury, we got through it. It made me better. Uh, made my relationship with Alan better. Um, made me appreciate everything I have even more. And it made me more motivated to uh, reach my ultimate goal. So Alan, what do you do? What do you do in that situation? You're handed a lot right off the bat and it's the draft and there's a lot happening. What do you do to spin this into something that is a positive for your new client? Well, I think what was unique was I, I had come into Montreal uh, around early August, maybe even end of July. And I was basically there every day with Max for almost the entire month up until I think a couple of days before the start of uh, uh, camp, um, I had gone back to LA. I was, I was gone for four, four weeks, but it allowed Max and I to be together every day. So there wasn't one day during that month where we weren't seeing each other, whether it was um, at the, at the rink in the gym, uh, uh, having breakfast, having lunch, having dinner, stopping by the house. Um, we were just always together. And I think that helped really create the bond that existed. And the one thing that was important for me that, that Max and his family knew is that I would do anything to get him into a better position than he was in. And I really didn't care what it was that I needed to do. I was going to do it. And my commitment was unshakable. And it was really that entire month, it, it dominated literally every thought that I had for the entire month until it came, uh, in, in, until it came to, to an end. And I remember when... Uh, the trade occurred to Vegas and uh, part of the deal was we had to negotiate an extension with Vegas um, before the trade would be completed. Um, that day, from the moment I got the call that the trade is done in principle pending an extension being agreed to between Max and Vegas, that entire, you know, eight hour period was one of the most intense eight hours of, of my entire life. And that includes trying 40 murder cases. And um, when it finally got over the finish line um, with little, I think we got the deal done that we had, there was a deadline attached to um, when the contract had to be agreed to or the trade would be nullified. Um, we got it done, I think, one or two minutes before the deadline. Wow. That's how intense it was there that last 20, 30 minutes. And when it was all over, um, I was, I was at home. It was, it was already in the evening. I was at home by myself and I remember just getting off the phone. The deal's completely done. Um, and I literally, I was just shaking out of the adrenaline for the last eight hours where you're not eating, you're not uh, drinking anything. And you just constantly feel like you got to stick up your back, uh, <laughs> for eight straight hours to finally just have that, that release. Wow. Max. How was that for you as a guy who you said you were already feeling overwhelmed and you're going down to the last one or two minutes? You know, I've never really thought of in hindsight how 
much of a stress and how much of a burden it would be on Alan as well. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> you know what? Before I knew Alan, I knew about, you know, the tweets and, you know, Alan is a outspoken guy, but I think this story should go, should be, uh, should resonate with everyone as to why he does what he does and how he'll do what literally whatever it takes. He'll come to Montreal, leave his family for, for four weeks to put me and my family in a better situation. So, uh, I mean, Alan, I, the way you're just describing that, I wish I had that much of an understanding as to how much, uh, it played on you as well. I, I did to some degree to not, not to this extent. And, uh, you know, it, uh, I wish everybody, um, can understand that when they have someone in their corner, like Alan did, uh, for myself and my family, how, just how, uh, I don't know, just how much easier it is to go about your life knowing that you have a, a guy like him sticking up for you. So the process was hard on both of us. Um, and the fact that it was so hard on him, I think makes, uh, it, is the only reason why we were able to come to the agreement that we came to. I mean, I think we needed our own phones for each other with how much we were talking. <laughs> I mean, middle of the night, text, Hey, what do you think about this? Or <laughs> what do you think about that? I, we'd be reading every team's cap and say, Hey, maybe this team will work or maybe that team will work. But at the end of the day, you can't even think about the amount of hours that have put into that we were putting into it, whether it just be thoughts or, or research or, uh, um, media trying to read the media as to what was going on. And, uh, because at the end of the day, you're not allowed to talk with teams about this stuff. So, you you know, I would see something in the media or someone text me, Alan, do you think this is true? I mean, it was just endless for an entire summer straight. Um, but you know, like anything in my life, like anything in your guys' lives, that makes you better. That makes our bond better. That makes you a better person, a better player. And, uh, I'm thankful I went through that, through that, uh, tough time as hard as it was. Uh, I think we're all better from it. Wow. And, and, you know, it must have felt like it. And I think, I think another player that probably can relate to you more recently is Jack Eichel. Oh yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine you guys have had some conversations. Oh but... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, what's interesting about this is your similar, your situation has some parallels, Max. And it, when you got off the plane to Vegas, you know, I, I, I'm just thinking about how Jack Eichel was greeted at the hotel. Um, it must've felt, or did it feel like a breath of fresh air or a ton of pressure? What, what was it like for you? No, we, I mean, we feel the same way as soon as we got here. Uh, like I was just kind of, when he, when he came here, I was kind of watching him. Like, <laughs> let's see, let's see how he reacts. And, you guys have this. I can't believe that. Like they do this for you guys. I can't, I can't believe that. I was just like the, it was like a kid in the candy store. He was so happy. And I thought back to, you know, that day when I first came here and, you know, I went on the strip for a helicopter ride and my name was up on all the casino uh, boards and you're just, you're blown away by the way that they, they treat the players here. And, and, uh, and that's why this team has had a lot of success. I really think so. I mean, the, from taking players on organizations that didn't feel wanted, putting them together, creating this culture of, you know, the golden misfits, you know, uh, kind of twisting that into a situation where, you know, guys like myself and Stoney come in, we didn't feel wanted really in our situations. They, they've really done a great job of that here. And, and, uh, you know, Jack, we talked, we spoken about, um, kind of his situation and, and Buffalo, how it could be a little bit comparable to mine in Montreal, but really th those doors are closed. <laughs> He's not looking back at all. I didn't want to look back at all. Let's just worry about winning a cup here in Vegas and, and, uh, all the, all the positives that come with, you know, playing here in Vegas, it, it really is the best place to play in the league. And, and, and I know anyone would say that about where they play, but in my mind, it's not even close. And, uh, um, an example for myself, from, from Jack, from Stoney, it's just, that's kind of icing on the cake. Stanley cup and maybe a gold medal too. Yeah, that'd be nice. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> Pretty good goalie lineup you guys have yeah. going into this year. I'm just saying, yeah, in this Canadian kind of nervous, <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. Uh, you guys, you guys are nothing to be nervous about over there. <laughs> <laughs> now, Max, there's been a lot of change in Montreal in the last 24 hours. Uh, a lot of people that, uh, that you knew well and worked with for many years are, are no longer with the organization. Um, do you have any thoughts 
about, uh, uh, you, you know, you always want what's best for Montreal in the long run. Uh, you have any thoughts about uh, a path forward from this point on? Thoughts or am I, should I publish a book? I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. to, both, the book, to both. The book comes yeah. later. The book yeah. comes later. You're, you're right. I swear. Like I honestly, that's, I, I've put more hours thinking about, I wish people would ask me because I put more hours thinking about how to make that situation work in Montreal than anyone on the planet. I've seen everything there. I I've seen things elsewhere. I've seen how places operate in Montreal. Just, it can't operate like any other um, organization. There's just, you have to have a safe zone when you come to the rink, the, the rink has to be we're all in, all in this together. We support everybody. You played a bad game last night. Doesn't matter. You're you're in this family, and we're in this fight together. We're in the trenches together, and and you almost have to have that us against the world mentality in every single position in the organization. If there's one guy not pulling his weight when it comes to that, I, I just don't think you can handle any of that negativity because as soon as you leave the rink, there's going to be ups and downs in the season. There's going to be times you lose five games. But are you going to be able to come over, uh, come out of it through positivity? Or are you going to let the negativity swarm you, suffocate you, and ultimately turn that into a ten-game losing streak? Um, that's not to say that you know this guy wasn't doing the right job or that guy wasn't. I just think that the importance has to be stressed of positivity and and that new school approach of uh, oh. You no, know, not that old school mentality of, of uh, you know, the threatening and the, you better do this. Or it, it, I just think that can't work in Montreal. I've seen guys' names get thrown in the ring. Matthew Darsh, I mean, I played with him. Danny Breer, I mean, that would be outstanding. If, if someone there is listening, I think one of these players, if they were to get one of those jobs and they played in Montreal, they know what it's like. Look at Tampa Bay. They're progressive in their approach with how they treat players, with how they, uh, you know, go above and beyond to make players feel comfortable uh, to perform at their best. Um, an example of Vegas was uh, my first end of the year meeting went in there a little bit, you know, you get, get butterflies a little bit. We lost in the first round game seven, should have won that series, had Stanley cup expectations. All right. They're probably going to rip me. And I, I sit down with uh, George McPhee and Kelly McCrimmon and they go, what can we do better for you? <laughs> Wow. I was blown away. I, I, I told everyone that story as soon as I left the rink. I'm like, wow, these guys, I mean, they get it with this progressive thinking of they understand the players they have in that room. We will do whatever it takes to win, but they also want to do whatever it takes to win by helping us. And, and I think that's the way that not just the NHL pro sports are heading in general. And you see a bit of a shift in some of these franchises where they've had a lot of success with that type of thinking. And and that needs to be stressed even more so in Montreal than anywhere else because there's so much pressure on the players um, from the outside. You can't let that creep inside. And, and those are, I guess, uh, the short version of, of what I think should uh, happen in Montreal for them to be successful. And I'd love to see that happen. I have a question. And this yeah. is completely off script. Alan, I apologize in advance. <laughs> when it's all over, Max... When you're, when, I don't know, 48 years old and you're tired of the ice baths, um, <laughs> do you think that you would be the kind of guy who would want to go into management? I've thought about that. I mean, uh, it seems like you're passionate about it. I am passionate about it, but I'm also passionate about my family and <laughs> and uh, and concentrating a lot on them. I, I haven't put too much thought. I know that I have a lot of ideas because I I analyze everything. I analyze everything the, from every position, um, every organization I've been in. I, I, I try and see the pros and the cons and I kind of always outweigh them. And I think a lot as Alan knows, I think, <laughs> I think all the time about um, uh, different scenarios, but that's a tough one. We'll see where my family's at when that, when that time rolls around, but uh, yeah, you never know what could happen. Yeah, but with Max, with you, it's not just the organizations that you've been a part of. I've uh, never oh, yeah. talked to any player who is as knowledgeable about how literally every other organization in the league is being run and can talk authoritatively 
of the negatives and positives of everything going on. Uh, and, and, and you can have that conversation. I don't know many other people who can. Yeah. I mean, but I see a, an advantage from it, uh, for it, uh, in my game and our, I can bring that to our organization. Um, I was in Montreal training with, uh, Kemba Bay's, uh, strength coach. He talked about their skating coach said that, that it, you know, uh, brought Braden point from an average skater to one of the best skaters in the league. I, I said, Oh, can I get her number? Spoke to her and, you know, like things like that. It, it, organizations kind of all have their little, uh, niches, I should say, is what makes them successful. And it's kind of cool to say, uh, you know, Oh, Tampa does this or, uh, the Rangers do that. You know, my strength coaches in New York and would tell me a couple of things that they would do or, you know, different routines from top players in the league, what they do to feel good on game night. Any information you can grab is valuable, whether it be positive or negative. And uh, I just feel like um, certain organizations kind of uh, seek out that, uh, that kind of material more so than others. And the ones that do, I keep using the word progressive, but they, you know, they seem to be the ones that have the most success and uh, the individual players as well. Wow. Uh, with, with the person you're referring to, would that be Barb Underhill? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I spoke to her a few times Didn't end up working with her, but worked with a couple of skating coaches. Uh, Lars Hepsbo. Hepso was actually the one that recently, uh, I worked with the most, uh, he's out in Arizona, uh, Shea Theodore, best skater I've played with brought him in. And it was just amazing. The stuff I learned and, and really what's cool. And to circle this back to the youth hockey, I sent my kids out there with him, got on the ice with them. And just saw such a different, um, such a difference in their skating after working with them. And kids are like sponges. You know, I see them learn something and pick something up. I'm like, all right, if this works for them, let me try this out. And I noticed a huge different, uh, a difference in myself as well. Unfortunately, coming off a broken foot, so I haven't been able to really um, put that to, to use. But in camp, I, it was a noticeable difference and uh, stuff like that. It just seems like every summer I'm I'm doing. And that's what makes greatness, Max. So listen, um, I, I just want to say thank you for giving your time over to us today. This has been an absolutely fascinating interview. Um, and I hope it's not the last time we, we get to have you. Yeah, I hope uh, next time we can divulge a couple more secrets, right, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a part two one day. <laughs> no, no, we're good. We got enough out there. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> 